So uh, if you will just uh, tell us your name and where you're at and just a little bit of biographical information to get us started. Okay, uh, Dave Johnson. I'm a Curator's uh, Distinguished Professor at the University of Missouri uh, in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, I've been, I've had previous positions at, um, at the Pennsylvania State University and uh, University of Colorado in Denver and University of North Carolina Greensboro. Uh, ironically enough, it was with a part-time job. I was an uh, undergraduate at the University of Delaware working my way through school. I worked summers and worked during the year, worked in the library, worked in registration and so on. Those became somewhat boring. So. One day I uh, responded to an advertisement in the placement office for a job of a television cameraman. <laughs> and uh, for the Educational Television Network, we were producing um, a lot of educational television programming in those days, mainly courses, official formal courses. Uh, way different setup. We used to have a big studio, 15,000 watts of lights, uh, two inch quadruplex tape, uh, you know, control room, the whole thing like that. Uh, I did lighting, I did uh, television camera work, I did directing, uh, got involved in more video work with a television repertory workshop and we started a campus radio station so I became kind of a media hog as it were and, and uh, had a good friend and a, and a mentor at, at the university there who had just received a master's in educational media and so I thought that was a pretty cool uh, thing to do. <laughs> uh, I knew that ultimately that I would need uh, some educational experience uh, because I was my undergraduate degree of all things was in finance, had no, having nothing to do, but but uh, with with media. But uh, so I, I went off and got a master's in elementary education and taught for two years uh, as an elementary and middle school uh, reading language arts teacher. Uh, all the time, continuing to work on uh, media projects and also beginning to take courses in psychology which I had never had as an undergraduate. Um, in the middle of my master's program uh, I sort of became acquainted with the job of a professor and thought that might be a really neat thing to do. <laughs> and so um, I, uh, after my completing my master's degree and then working uh, for a couple of years as a teacher, decided to enroll in a doctoral program at Temple University in Philadelphia where I, you know, began studies. I took a year off from that program to work a, on an educational television program for the Office of Migrant Education in New Jersey, uh, doing television, produ primarily television production, uh, and then uh, went back and pursued the, my, my, the remainder of my uh, uh, doctorate at, uh, at, at Temple University. And so those days were really quite different. Uh, those were the days of media, media studies, and media comparisons. Uh, we were looking at uh, a lot of television work, uh, educational television work. Radio was still a little bit in there. Films were being used a, a, a little bit, but uh, the, the dominant media in those particular days was educational television. Uh, and so I worked with that and through that uh, for a considerable period of time. Uh, after graduating, I, I uh, took a job at the University of North Carolina Greensboro in a library science and educational technology department. And one of the reasons I got the job was they wanted someone to teach educational television, which I had done extensively. But uh, uh, in the early days, actually, I started uh, doing a lot of text design research, um, probably because it was cheap. <laughs> All you needed was a mimeograph machine and a, or a Xerox machine and uh, you could actually administer uh, lots of treat different treatments. I, I suppose I was a born empiricist. Um, I, I started doing empirical studies almost immediately. Continued to do a little bit of, of uh, video work and video research but, but uh, mainly moved over into more instructional design, text design kinds of research. Sort of in that period of time I, I suppose I you know, I learned that I was always a constructivist and always uh, interested more in the kinds of things that people do with media rather than from media. Um, the study that I did, one of my first studies I did at the University of North Carolina Greensboro was looking at the effects of video self-confrontation, looking at yourself on video for a period of time and the effect on self-concept and got some wildly uh, significant results. Uh, my early career 
was a little slow in getting started publishing, although I have always been a writer, and so I started I started doing some publishing. I was not mentored uh, in my doctoral program nearly as well as what we do for students now in terms of the publication process. However, in those days, it wasn't as imperative. Uh, nowadays, if you want to be successful in academia, you either publish or literally or you perish. Uh, and so. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, you know, did continue to do a little bit of research on on video as a self as a modeling and self confrontation tool, which was really really fascinating stuff. But then again, moved moved more directly into the text design research, where I published a couple of books and conducted a number of studies. So, <laughs> so uh, our next question is: um, Could you please describe how your interests and, and aspirations have evolved and changed over time? Right. Okay. Um, that was kind of yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, again, I, I started doing the text design work, research and doing um, uh, doing more traditional instructional design uh, work and trying to learn learn the field of instructional design uh, better than I had been taught. Um, and I moved, um, I suppose I moved, uh, well, again, most of the 1980s I, I spent with the uh, text design research, and in the late 1980s we had these funny little machines called microcomputers that began to <laughs> show up in the, in, the, uh, in the building. We actually started out with some old CPM machines, uh, SOL S100 microbus machines, and had came stuck with four kilobytes of RAM and four kilobytes of ROM, and we could install four four kilo, kilobyte RAM boards so we could bump it up to 16 kilobytes and thought we were pretty invincible. There wasn't much we couldn't do with 16 kilobytes, uh, which which is humorous, obviously, in today's... <laughs> in today's uh, but uh, that began, you certainly, computers changed the nature of our discipline a great deal. It forced the issue. Uh, I designed various curricula around how to use microcomputers. Uh, I developed like 22 one hour, one credit hour courses to meet the needs of a whole wide variety of people within the college. And uh, it was really at that point that I began to think about the computer not as a teaching medium because in the early days of computer-based instruction, that was, the, that was the norm. We tried to embed the knowledge in the computer and, and ask the computer to do the teaching. Well, computers are really lousy teachers. Uh, and so I began to think about better uses and sort of uh, in the in the mid to I guess the mid 1980s to late 1980s sort of um, came up with this notion of, of mind tools that compelled my work for a number of years. The idea of using computer off the shelf computer tools as knowledge representation tools, thinking tools, kind of critical thinking tools. Uh, and so I ended up publishing uh, three different editions of uh, 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 books on mind tools. And we did lots of research and I went around uh, preaching uh, that particular gospel all over the, uh, the world. And uh, I still think it's a powerful medium. Unfortunately, in the late 1990s, this thing called the Internet came along and that's, that, sort of, that sort of took the interest away from that sort of thing. People now are, I mean, certainly, certainly virtually everything we do is so Internet-based. Uh, with particularly with it, uh, Internet 2 and uh, soon Internet 3. Um, we're looking at how to, to, to utilize that, that particular uh, technology more effectively. Uh, and it wasn't until the mid-1990s when I was at Penn State uh, teaching there that it dawned on me that in the entire instructional design literature there was virtually no discussion of problem solving. Uh, I think in all of the instructional design textbooks there was perhaps one chapter devoted to problem solving and so for whatever reason and whatever compelled me I don't know but except the absence I suppose of any literature in that area I decided that that would be something I would I would tackle and and uh, so for literally the past 15 or so years I I've, I've virtually all of my research has been focusing around what problem solving is, what kinds of problems there are, how to support, engage, and uh, assess different kinds of problem solving. And so that's, that's, that's probably going to be my legacy to the field if there is one, because uh, I've pushed. Although, although one of the other phenomena that occurred at the beginning in the early 1990s, my, my friend and colleague Tom Duffy from Indiana and I, University of Indiana and I started pushing the instructional design field in a constructivist direction. 
we had a lot of time, we had a lot of fun perturbing the field. And, and uh, you could tell over a period of a decade that the issues and the topics of, say, at conferences like AECT w was, was rapidly changing, uh, the nature of the questions that were being asked. Rather than looking at instructional methods or instructional media, we were beginning to look more at not only computers, but all technologies as tools for helping students, you know, construct their understanding of the world. And so that kind of orientation still compels me. You know, in this in the seventies, it was uh, we were looking at media and looking at the effectiveness of media as conveyors. Uh, the dominant paradigm then was what we call message design. The idea is that we could design a message more effectively to communicate an idea, then students would learn better. Uh, and that's what we are essentially were doing was trying to refine the age-old method of direct instruction, you know, where the teacher tells you about the world. Well, the teacher tells you more effectively using a variety of instructional strategies than, uh, than the effectiveness of the learning was, should, be more effect, should be more effective. I began to think a lot with the Mind Tools work about learning strategies rather than instructional strategies. What can the learner do? Uh, to better understand things irrespective of what's being taught. Uh, and so those media days, um, the message design media days really pretty much I think went through the 1980s and then it was really beginning in the early 1990s that we began and with the advent of the microcomputer as a more of a personal tool that students could use that we began thinking in a much more constructivist direction um, and clearly, I think a lot of people are, are, uh, are convinced that, in fact, knowledge is constructed. Uh, whether or not you believe it, it it's true. Uh, the major misconceptions that have occurred, of course, is, uh, relates to the notion of constructivist instruction, which is an oxymoron. Uh, yeah, you know, you, I mean, people, regardless of what happens and regardless of what you do, people will construct whatever meaning they can from a particular situation, uh, oftentimes irrespective of what it is you do to them. Uh, they've got their own personal experiences and personal needs and they're going to make sense out of, out of what they experience in, in their own way regardless of what we do. Uh, and so I think, you know, with the, uh, with the advent of the internet and sort of ubiquitous sources of knowledge or, excuse me, ubiquitous sources of information and now with the new mobile technologies, you've got, you've got ubiquitous access to information. I think the nature of the, of the questions are, are changing substantially and I, uh, certainly with the advent of social networking, really as, as a communication tool, uh, is having profound effects, I think, on on um, on the world. Uh, witness the the recent uh, revolutions in Northern Africa, which are which were mediated by social networking. Uh, just shows the phenomenal impact. Um, <clears throat> and so, I think there are other issues that are po possibly good or possibly bad. I don't regard around social networking um, uh, that are not necessarily. I mean, I think. I'm concerned about the social psychology of, of identity and, and responsibility and issues like that in certain social networking environments. I, I think uh, technology is technology has provided instantaneous access to to different uh, to different support systems like mom or dad or, or friends or whatever, and, and that unfortunately has made a lot of people unwilling or unable to actually take responsibility for their own activities in their own charge and that can have fairly serious impact but but the reality is that that the internet and social networking has has be, have become so dominant that it's going to change our society in a, in a significant way uh, and that's probably going to be the, the future of research for some time to come heaven knows what else you know what else may come along uh, I think a lot of people are looking uh, longingly toward the uh, potential of virtual reality uh, for uh, for engaging students in ways in rich ways that we otherwise cannot do now. Phenomenal impact. I still think we're a, an integration or two away from being able to really do that sort of of, of thing effectively. But I suspect uh, 
within the next couple of decades, we're going we're gonna to see some really, really powerful environments. Well, you know, in the early days of instructional design, I was studying very traditional instructional design. Actually, Dave Merrill was one of my heroes. I, I studied his stuff and actually uh, had working models of some of his uh, instructional design two ideas before he did. Uh, so again, it was it's a very coherent theory of instructional design, but again, uh, really in the early 1990s, I began to move in a very strong constructivist direction, which sort of, you know, took me off in a, in a substantively different tangent than, than Dave's work or traditional instructional design work. Uh, but so much of my work has really been, I think, instructional. A lot of the books that I've written have been basically uh, focused around teaching students in the instructional design community things that had not been articulated yet. I've done a couple of editions of, an, of Task Analysis book, which is really the heart and soul of any kind of design. Uh, unfortunately, it's a skill that's underdeveloped, I think, in most programs, and so students ultimately end up learning one or maybe two methods of instructional design. So. Uh, which means that every, you know their instructions all going to look. If you only have one method of analyzing learning, then their methods, all their methods, going to look the same. Um, I tell my students all the time: if you aren't able to articulate how your learners are supposed to think, then you really have no business designing instruction for them. Uh, that's not a very you know satisfying response for them. But I mean, so those kinds of those kinds of skills. But but again, the the uh, the constructive stuff really took me through most of the 1990s and then I became focused on problem solving as certainly one of the ultimate constructivist activities. I mean when you have a problem to solve then you've got, you, it's imperative that you, you construct an understanding, a representation and some understanding of the problem before you're able to solve it. And so uh, when you look at the, uh, the many "Quote unquote constructivist innovations, the simulations and the games and the and uh, the the multi-user immersive uh, immersive environments and all of those kinds of activities. At the root of all of those is problem solving. That's what they're doing in those environments. And then I began to work a lot with engineers and engineering education, and uh, we've done a lot of research in that field. And uh, when you go out and analyze what uh, people do, what engineers do, but virtually what anyone does is solve problems. Nobody gets paid for writing an examination booklets. Yet, in fact, that's how we continue to assess student understanding, uh, which is unfortunate. But so, you know, I, schools and universities, I think, especially do a really woefully poor job of actually engaging student in problem solving in any way. And, my interest in problem solving really from a cognitive perspective though has sort of transmogrified over into problem-based learning. So we, we're working with a number of, of entities, organizations, uh, institutions uh, around, around trying to embed uh, or engage problem-based learning in their, in, their, um, in their education. Very problematic kind of effort because students have learned to do to do traditional school and when you ask them to start solving problems that that really violates all their scripts for for learning all their schemas are about how do I study for the test how do I get the, the right answer on the test and and then and then move on uh, so that that's been a challenge and continues to be a challenge and, and will continue to be a challenge although uh, as I tell people all the time, I truly believe that problem-based learning is the most significant pedagogical innovation in the history of education. It's not sexy like computers or technology, but, but it's substantive in terms of how learners are supposed to think. And that's really the, that's the key to the whole thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, too many people have always assumed, or I believe, I think believe that students learn from the technology, and that's just simply not true. People learn from thinking, and if the technology can help people think better, then so be it. Um, but at least that's my particular philosophy. Well, as I mentioned, Dave Merrill earlier, I think he really is. Um, I mean, in, in terms of traditional theories of instructional design, his, I believe, has always been the most coherent. Um, I was also very, always very enamored of and very impressed by the work of Gabriel Salomon at the University of Tel Aviv. Uh, brilliant guy, done, he's done just absolutely brilliant research uh, and has always been at the forefront, I think, of, of, uh, 
uh, of our field. And so even though he's not normally associated with, with the field of instructional design that closely, I think he's probably done as much or more for, for the field as, as, uh, as anyone. Um, after that, you know, I, I began to read widely in situated learning, and um, I think the work of Jean Lave has been, um, Barbara Rogoff has been particularly uh, in, influential in my thinking. Uh, Jim Wirch uh, at, uh, I think he's at Wash U in St. Louis, right around down the road. Uh, people like that, I think, have, have been, but also then by, you know, by the 1990s, I had actually identified my own uh, agenda and began to pursue it and and, and hopefully somewhat influence myself uh, but but historically the you know those are some of the people I think that have, have really been uh, Bob Hynek a very one of the old guys in the field was also very influential he uh, I did a philosophical paper in ECTJ back in the early 1980s and Bob was even though he had no reason to he, he was the editor of the, the journal for a while, he really mentored me in a way. We went through six or seven iterations on the paper, and he would, he would write these seven-page longhand uh, letters in response to my latest drafts, and so I, we finally got it good enough to publish. Uh, so, uh, you know, my hat's off to him. Uh, and, and certainly a number of, a number, you know, I mean, I've had a number of friends and colleagues in the field who have, on whom I've, 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 Lent, leaned a little bit, uh, but 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 in terms of intellectual uh, stimulation, I you know most recently by uh, by more by the constructivists. I'm a big fan of a woman named Deanna Kuhn at, at Teachers College in Columbia. She's done years and years and years of work on argumentation, just absolutely brilliant work. So, um, he, and so many other colleagues from whom I've drawn inspiration and work, uh, but but not in a really consistent manner. Well, the thing, I mean, obviously, the, <clears throat> I mean, in the early part of my career, we, I mean, the field was still dominated by direct instruction, and so we were trying to figure out how to get it done better. Uh, and that, you know, that was an important one. And I, and I, again, I chose text design as a method for doing that. I, I spent a half a year at the University of Kiel with a good friend of mine, uh, Jim Hartley, who was really one of the best known text design researchers in the, in the world. And we had a lot of fun doing, doing research and, and uh, hanging out at the pub. Uh, that was a good time. Uh, but then, the, you know, but then my work at, at beginning in the early 1990s really shifted into the sort of the constructivist direction. I think, I think people for a while thought I had a big C plastered on my chest or something. Uh, not so. It was really more. Uh, it was really more fun. I don't, you know. Uh, and and the purpose was not to suggest an alternative, or it was to suggest an alternative, but not a replacement. I think we still have these um, immature and dualistic debates about which model is better. Right now, it's direct instruction versus unguided instruction, which is both are really misnomers. Uh, and I and I think that kind of dualistic thinking is really uh, destructive of our field. Uh, clearly, you know, the ability to accommodate multiple beliefs and multiple. Uh, perspectives is, is, is I think absolutely important for any field of endeavor. There's no, there's no unified theory of learning. I think a lot of people have looked for that and a lot of psychologists over the years have promoted their particular theories is that this is, you know, this is the theory that that's all, that's all we need to know for how to design good instruction. Well, that just doesn't exist because the variety of learning outcomes is so vast and so diverse that there's no single method of instruction that you know that can work. And a lot of people misinterpret my my beliefs as, as I'm totally against direct instruction, which is just not true. I think there are times, there are many times during during complex problem solving processes that I want to learn something, and that's the teachable moment. You know, teach me how to do this now, and you'll save me a lot of time and effort. Uh, so. You know, I'm not advocating. I'm not advocating any particular uh, methodology. Even with the mind tools work, I said this is an alternative way of actually using computers. It's not going to save schools. Uh, it's not going to change the nature of, of the course of education. But uh, but but in fact, it's a it's a way of I think more productively and constructively using using the technologies that we have. Uh, and so um, and clearly, then over the last decade and a half. 
um, the constructivist orientation has really kind of morphed into the, the problem solving stuff. And so I'm pretty much going to ride that horse until the end of my career uh, I, right now. Largely because you know, I think I've scratched the surface in terms of articulating uh, a meta theory of problem solving, but I don't pretend that I you know, know near enough. There is so much we don't know about problem solving. There are so many unanswered questions. And the outcome is so important that, you know, there are literally thousands of studies that I can conceive of that really need to be done. And unfortunately, I don't have enough years to do those. But, yeah. uh, interesting question. I, you know, I, was, I would sort of hope I haven't made it yet. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I'm not sure, probabilistically, that's, the, that's necessarily the case. Uh, I am actually very proud of the book I just published on problem solving. I think it's sort of a compilation of the work I've done uh, over uh, the last 15 years. Coupled with that, I would say I edited two versions of the uh, Handbook of Research in our field. They were both large 1,500-page tomes, uh, which I pretty much single-handedly took on both times. Uh, and so they were, I think, in terms, of, in terms of contributions to the field, people perhaps recognize those as the most important, and quite legitimately so. Um, you know, a number of other uh, books that I've done, I think that I'm really proud of, because they're tools, they're handbooks. I really, for some strange reason, focused my career on handbooks, basically teaching you know, teaching the field things. Uh, Barbara Gabowski and I um, uh, wrote... Um, back in the early 1990s, wrote a handbook of individual differences, learning and instruction. And it's still quite a useful handbook, even though it's it's significantly dated by now. But uh, so for some reason, you know, I mean, utility has always sort of compelled me for whatever reason. Um, so, you know, I suppose the handbook, the big research handbooks are probably that which I perhaps will be most recognized for. I think the, the research on problem solving, the body of research that we've done on problem solving, because I think they have provided a unique, a unique perspective. Just as I think our work on constructivism uh, sort of pushed the field in a different direction as evidenced by the nature of the, the papers that are submitted to this conference and other conferences, I now see the problem solving as being much more strongly represented in the topics that people are researching in our field, both in terms of the uh, papers that I, re that I review for publication and the conference presentations here at this conference. Uh, I see a lot more people looking into problem solving. I don't think they completely understand it yet, not that any of us really do, um, but, but that's very gratifying. You know, when you know that you've had an effect on a field, uh, even in some small and subtle way, I think that's, that's a pretty good testament to your career. They're not all pretty. <laughs> Be as yeah. honest as you, yeah, as you, as you, like. you care to be. Right, 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 right. I came from a broken home. My parents were divorced when I was four, uh, and we lived with my mother in southern Indiana. And I, I you know, I think what really <clears throat> the most significant effect on our lives was the fact that we were all both positive and negative. Was the fact that we were pretty much raised as young adults. Uh, we had to be pretty much independent. Uh, and self-reliant uh, throughout our childhood. Uh, and we always pretty much excelled in school. We never caused problems. We never, you know, because my, our mother had a difficult enough life trying to, trying to deal uh, with that. So, uh, so I, think, I think the sense of, of adulthood and self-reliance, yeah, there's some negatives there as well, but uh, perhaps didn't have the childhood that we could have or should have. But, but you know, that for me is really, I think, the whole notion of self-reliance and personal responsibility is just so endemic in, in my belief system. Uh, I think it's a real significant problem in our society. I think personal responsibility has just been uh, mil uh, mitigated so much by entitlement. And, um, and more frighteningly, I think the whole notion of social responsibility has just gone by the wayside. I, you know, I, 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 I'm somewhat pessimistic about the future, uh, certainly of the country and the world. Uh, hopefully, you know, those, those values will change, but when I see the political discourse in our country these days, I, you know, it, I'm not given a great deal of hope. <laughs> uh, for me, yeah, um, um, 
Well, I'm, I've always been physically active. My wife and I are very active. We run and we work out, and so um, my my passion is mountain climbing. Uh, we live in Colorado in the summer, and so I, I just I love to climb mountains. Uh, I'll do technical mountains with a guide, uh, with on rope, um, you know, or just even easy mountains. I, there's just something for me spiritual about going up a mountain. I mean, if you actually look at all the so many of the Old Testament and even New Testament uh, references, they were always going up to the mountain. <laughs> so I figured there had to be something good going on up there. Uh, and, and just the just the spiritual refreshment that you get from standing on top of a mountain is, is just really, for me, is compelling. So I love, uh, and, and just being out in nature. When I, uh, for 10 years, I was at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, and every chance I got, I'd be up in the Blue Ridge Mountains hiking or backpacking or, or whatever, and so. Uh, I'm also compelled by ski, which also requires mountains, uh, and so I love to do that as well. Uh, and other than that, I think traveling. I've been blessed, I suppose, because of my uh, because of whatever success I've had and academically. I've been invited many times to deliver talks and workshops and activities around the world, and so I've visited a lot more of the world than most people ever get to, and and that's been a real blessing, and and it's been very eye opening. Um, I really crave those those kinds of otherworldly experiences. What I what I call you ain't in Kansas anymore, Toto experiences. <laughs> you know, this place is really different. <laughs> you know, like going to Borneo or whatever. You know, I mean, it's just the, the culture is so different from anything we know of that it's you know that that it's uh, that I find I find it really really compelling. Although more recently, my wife and I have really been focusing our energies on Italy. It's a wonderful, my wife is Italian and so, and we love the, the people and the culture and the food. It's really a wonderful place to visit. Well, yeah, interesting question. I mean, my wife and I are Catholic and so you, that that impels you in a particular a direction, but, uh, and, and for me, religion, I mean, religion is not so much about dogma as it about how you live your life. Um, it's it's really interesting when you get into church politics how petty and vindictive people can actually be and I just sometimes want to shake them and say you know aren't you listening to the gospels uh, come on folks uh, so I, most compelling to me is is really how you live your life and 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 uh, and the manner in which you do so and the manner in which you relate to other people uh, and again, that whole idea of self-reliance and, and uh, personal responsibility, I think, is just absolute. Uh, that's, you know, from a personal perspective. I know I understand. I've been asked that question many times, and, and frankly, I don't know the answer to it. I guess it's just not, not that hard. Um, writing is, you know, for many people, is a difficult endeavor. I've, I've always been fairly successful and found writing to be a fairly easy task. Uh, and I've got a head full of ideas. Uh, and when I look at the world, uh, I, you know, I always look at not only the implications, but also the, you know, the, the research needs. I, typically, every time I read a paper, I, I in, invariably come up with three or four other research topics related to that paper that really ought to be done, could be done. Uh, so I, you know, I'm an implicational thinker in that, in that sense. Uh, in terms of advice, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, I think the only advice I can give is time management. Uh, and by that I mean, uh, as, an, as a young academic, you've really got to carve out time for doing those sorts of things. Uh, whether, you, uh, whether you work in the office successfully or work more successfully at home. Uh, gosh, in my first job at the University of North Carolina Greensboro, uh, I had a carol, uh, a closed door academic carol in the library, and no one ever found me there. <laughs> so I could go and, and, and work without any kind of interruption. Um, so I think it's a matter of carving out significant portions of time where you can work, I think, effectively. Working on ideas is not something you can do in 15 or 20 minute bits. You've got you've to you've apply um, yourself over a longer period of time. And, so, and, and fortunately, uh, in most situations, academics have the flexibility to be able to do that. Um, I tell people all the time that I've certainly committed my share of mistakes in life, but career choice wasn't one of them. I, I can't imagine doing or having done anything other than what I've done. There is no job in the world that is, I think, more fulfilling, that has more autonomy. Um, and 
So I find it fulfilling perhaps because I've done a lot, but you know, uh, personal satisfaction is, is achieved in many, many ways. Uh, and so I've just felt compelled to do that. I suppose I'm neurotic in some sense, uh, you know, or at least I'm, I'm impelled to do these sorts of things. And yeah, I really, really stop to ask why. It's just there and I do it because I enjoy it. Um, and yeah. Great. So uh, the last question is just, is, is there anything we haven't touched upon that, that you, you feel you'd like to address? Don't can't well, I, I you know I'm sure I can think of lots of things but I mean uh, but I think we've pretty much covered covered the ballpark. Great, yeah. great. Well, thank you so oh, much for agreeing to do. This.